this chapter captures what is God's word and how should we use it. These words, beginning in verse 1. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will, not, you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, For he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon him. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. And i got to pause this right there. Because so often that, that passage, you know, eight, especially 8 and 9, get kind of shared and quoted and everything. And they're like, oh, God's way above us and all of that. But what specifically is he referring to? Back to verse 7. The thing that we would never do is forgive the person who sinned against us. The thing that we would never do is pardon someone's guilt. And that is exactly what makes God's way of thinking so much different, so much higher than ours. Verse 9, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my, what's that word? Yeah, it's kind of hard to say. What's that word? It's word, right? So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but what's that next word? Will. Will, not maybe, not like we hope, we'll just sort of, no, it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. Remember, that's the word shalom. It doesn't just mean absence of conflict, it means restoration and being filled with his hope and his, and his love. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree, and instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. I mean, guys, this is God's word. This is his promise to you and to me. This is what God's word is, and this is how we then come before him and and pull out the sword, you know, take, take hold of his sword. And it's interesting because in Isaiah 55, he's saying, my word, this is what my word will do. And then in so many other places, Ephesians 6 and Hebrews chapter 4, we see all these places where, where it's, his word is described as a sword, which is very interesting because a sword is kind of this offensive weapon. It's something we do. It's something we use. And, and the question then becomes, how do you use it? And, you know, before the events of this week unfolded, you know, I had all these other stories I was going to share with you, but I didn't, we don't need any of those. Because when we see a tragedy like this, then people start using God's word. And some of it is wonderful and amazing. But then there were a couple things that we heard this week that were not God's word. Oh, the reason those little babies died is because God needed more angels in heaven. I mean, that is false teaching. That is utterly opposed to God's word. And what we need to do today is we need to answer, ask the question, why? How do we know that? How do we, where do we find these things? And how do we then use them in our lives when we have loved ones who are going through terrible things? That's what we're going to do today as we go and we pick up the sword. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us as we go before him and share his word with each other. 
Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the promises that you give to us. And we ask you right now to come into this place in a powerful way that we would have opening of our eyes and opening of our hearts that we would trust you, that we would trust what you say and not what we observe with our own eyes or our own thoughts or our own reason, but that instead we would let your word come over us and wash over us and direct us. We pray in this time as we look at these scriptures that you would expand us, our knowledge and our ability to follow you by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you would pour out your, your grace and your mercy and your perfect peace. Amen. So, is that right? I mean, did God just need some more angels? I mean, was heaven so quiet that he needed more people? I mean, this is ridiculous. And so, one of the things that was very interesting for me as, as, as I was growing up, when I, when I went to college the first time, I've shared with you some, some of you guys the story, I was a Domino's pizza driver for here in Branson back in the years 1991 and 92. And uh, those were the glory days of Branson when there were no roads other than the strip. And you had to, you know, go through the field if you wanted to beat the traffic, which was very hard for my little Japanese car. And so, and so we were doing all this stuff and delivering pizza, and it was great. And what would happen is I would come back at late at night, 5 o'clock in the morning after all the fun was over, and I would go to bed. And the next morning before I'd come back down to Branson and do that, then I would go to the bank. And there was this just beautiful teller in the bank window, and her name is Debbie. Some of you have met her. We're now married. And, and we, I would do my tips, deposit the tips into the bank and everything. So the joke was, um, you know, she married me for my money. Boy, was that ever a bait and switch. And so, and so we're doing that. And in the process of doing that, one of, you know, after a while we got together, and I was asking her, I said, how do you tell the difference between the counterfeit bills and the real ones? Because I know they're out there. And she said, well, what we do is we spend all of our time studying the real ones. We don't ever look at the other ones because then if we know the real ones clear, if we know them good, then when we see a fake one, it's a, we see it a mile away. Take a look at, um, we've got some questions here that we're going to take a look at because I want you to see how this plays out. Um, these are what everyone's questions, and you're, you, all of us have these kinds of questions. How do I learn what God wants from me? Do, how do I hear God's voice? People will say that. They're like, God spoke to me today and said you should go buy, buy a Ferrari. You know, is it, did he really say that? I don't know. I mean, maybe he did. Well, let's find out. How do we do that? Why won't he just tell me what to do? I was sharing with the leadership team not too long ago. I wish Jesus would just send me an email, right? Just give me the bullets and we'll, we'll do them. He says jump, we'll say how high. Why doesn't he do that? And then how do we discern the truth? How do we do this? What's, what tools do we have? How does God guide us in all of this? Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. This is where we start our, our sort of survey of the Word of God um, because this explains everything to us and explains exactly what Debbie was sharing with me in the drive through window. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, but whose delight is in the... Now, it gets translated law in our Bibles, and some of, some of us grew up in faith backgrounds where we think the law is bad. And I want to make sure it's the, it's the Hebrew word Torah, and it means the instructions, the teachings. It means the Word of God, right? So it, whose delight is in the Word of the Lord, and on His Word, he or she meditates day and night. It's just, it's just like they do at the bank. We don't worry about learning about all the false things. Let's just focus the original. Let's, let's learn the truth, and let's know what the real thing says. Because, guys, if you spend time in God's Word, if you, if you do that, something's going to happen. There's a, we always like to share the theological description of this. We always say God's Word does stuff. Right? That's real theological. Do you like that? I came up with that by myself. And so, and so we, he does stuff. Take a look at the next verse. Verse 3, what does the Word of God do to you and me when we do this? It, make, it says, we become like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. And whatever he or she does prospers. Now, we've got to be careful because we live in America, and the word prosper it hits our ears a little different than it would other people. We're talking about prosperity you know, it's like we said a few weeks ago, prosperity in the cemetery, right? We're talking about life that never ends. We're talking about when you have a tragedy that you can have hope in the midst of the tragedy. We're talking about this idea that, that when we go through life, we trust in what God wants rather than what we want, even though you'll find those two come together more frequently than you would ever imagine. And so 
part of that's because you're spending time with him, right? And so this is so important. And prosperity in the cemetery. That's, that's what this is about. And it's, it's life everlasting. But then along the way, the new creation, as we were talking about in Bible class, the, the new creation of Christ, the eighth day of creation, when he rose from the dead, he dwells inside of us and he does stuff through his word in your life and in mine. And it impacts everything because it changes the decisions that we make. It impacts the way that we, when we're in the middle of a struggle, how do we react to that struggle? And when we're feeling tremendous pain, how do we have hope? If we're in God's Word, it changes everything. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Now, what's interesting about this passage is, again, this is kind of the next stop on our tour, is here we have this, this I mean, it's just an amazing comment He says, for the word of God is living and active. Have you ever had that situation where you've you've opened up a Bible passage that you maybe have read a thousand times or 10,000 times, and you read it, and suddenly you see something new happen again, right? Something you didn't see before. Today we were in Bible class, and and, and we were looking at uh, John chapter 7 because we were studying something to do with the water, the living water that Christ had been talking about. And it just, it had never dawned on me, but the very first words out of his mouth in John chapter 7 verse 38 is he says, come to me all you who are thirsty. That's Isaiah 55 verse 1. How did I never see that? I don't know. My brain is thick, but he's always living and active. He's working, right? And it's like, oh my goodness. That's what Jesus was talking about right then and there. And it's like, duh, but hey, He keeps working on even the most thick-headed among us. Now, look what he does. He says it's sharper than any double-edged sword. That's interesting because that sounds negative, right? In our culture, we're like weapons are bad. We don't want to talk about those. But why why is he using this metaphor? Why Why do we talk about the idea that God's word cuts? Let me ask you guys this question. Has God's word ever cut you before? Because my hand's going to go up. And just pretty much every time I sit down with it, it cuts me to the heart, right? And, and, and the reason it cuts is because it does a variety of things. We're going to take a look at those and look at, look at what he says. He says it penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow, and then look at this. This is not, you know, this is like, oh, this is not giving me, you know, the warm fuzzies. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the hearts. And you know how I love to always look at the original language. So I was hoping the word judge there was not the word judge. It's kind of the word judge, right? It's, it means actually like condemns or convicts. Right? It's actually harsher than that. And why do we think that? Why did I not want it to be that way? Because when I, what, the, what the Word of God does is it shows me my brokenness very often. It shows me the lack of what I need very often. And so the question then is, sometimes we will tend to zoom in on that, right? We will tend to kind of focus on that. And, and we do that for a lot of good reasons, but sometimes it can get into trouble. So we've got a little screen here which shows the law and the gospel. And in our faith tradition, these are words we use a lot. And sometimes you might have heard this being described as law and grace in other faith traditions or whatever. But the point is, is what are those two edges of the sword? One is the law and one is the gospel. Those are the two sided of the the sword. And what does the law say? It says don't murder. We all know that one, right? That's an easy one to remember. And it turns out not murdering people really helps you prosper in life. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. But see, then Jesus comes along. Jesus comes along, and he does something with this that he he just amps it up, right? He comes along, and he goes, I don't even want you to look at your brother with hate in your heart, because doing that is murdering them. And you're like, well, but... You mean the guy who cut me off on tra- in traffic? I can't even shake my fist at him, even if it's just you know, sort of like low and nobody can see it? Yeah. Yeah, see, this is the thing. And so what happens is, is when we really spend time with God's Word, the law starts to overtake us, and it starts to do what the, the Scripture said. It's, can, it cuts us. It convicts us, right? And we can begin to feel what we see there. It's because the law says do this or in some cases do not, such as in the case of murder. But how about this simple one? Jesus said, love your neighbor. Okay, all right, I I love to love my neighbor, that's great. Then he goes, actually, I want you to go one step further, and I want you to love your enemy. Now Jesus, now seriously, what do you mean by enemy? And then we're going to change the word enemy to be like neighbors that just have cars we don't like, or they don't talk, talk our language. What do you mean? What do you mean love my enemy? Love the person who hates me? Seriously? And see, this is... You see what we're talking about. And the law cuts us. 
it, it, it goes to the bone. It goes to the marrow. And what we see is we're never done with the law. I mean, we're just never done because I can always, if I pull up my resume today of how things went the past 24 hours, and I can look and see, well, uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. And some days it's like, are you kidding me? You didn't even get off the schneid, right? You know, as they say, you're, you're still at zero. You never even, because I like to think I'm at least 23% righteousness, righteous most of the time. But here's, how, here's how, see, what did Jesus do when they were nailing him to the cross? So they're driving the nails into his hands, and he has these words that come out of his mouth, into his hands and his feet, and he has these words that come out of his mouth, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You see how he was loving his enemies. See, see, we read the Bible, we read the Word of God, we hear it preached to us, sometimes we even eat it and drink it, and we hear it, or we experience it, or we encounter it, and, and it does stuff to us, and it cuts us. And that's what the law does. It shows us the sin in our lives. It shows us the brokenness and the darkness in our own hearts. And, and, it, and it says to us, do this. And it's never done. Right? But then the gospel points us to Jesus. And it tells us that he did this. And then he said on the cross, it is. Was that last word? In Greek, it's to telestai. It's a beautiful word. It means all the goals were accomplished. See, this is the gospel. We need to have both. If I just only say, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, you know, a lot of people are like, dude, I don't care. I mean, that's the world we live in. I don't care. When we have an event happen like we had this week and the world breaks in front of us with us all watching, I mean, literally, you got the cell phone on the Branson Bell recording it happen. I think we care. I think we need something more, right? We need the gospel. Take a look at Romans chapter 8, verse 3. It says, What the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did. So the law, while it does stuff, while it, it tells us what, it shows us our sin, it also shows us like what it means to love someone. And it also, it also you know, gives us the ability to have that horizontal relationship. So it, it kind of functions in those three ways. It, it, it shows us our sin. It, it gives us a guide on how to, or a curb, you might call it. Some people call it a curb. It, it, it helps people not sin as much. And then the other thing is it shows us how to love, right? It turns out that when we listen to Jesus saying, don't even hate your neighbor, um, that is the same as murdering. That does some, But none of that gives us the power to accomplish those things. It just shows us the problem. So what, the, what the law was powerless to do, God did by sending His own Son. And you know what we call that when we tell the story of God sending His own Son? We call that the Gospel, the good news. You know, in the Greek word, it's euangelion, which happens to also be my Wi-Fi password at home, so now you know. I mean, us geeks, we've got to stick together. So Romans chapter 1, verse 16 is the other passage. And, and this is so important, guys, because when we ask the question, what is the Word of God and how do we use it, this is the answer. Okay? I am not ashamed of the Gospel the good news, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. This is how we orient everything we do at praise and worship. We don't ever ignore the law. We obviously bring that to bear, and it's always present. But the power for faith, for hope, for love, for joy, for peace, for patience, for kindness, for faithfulness, and for gentleness, and for self-control, that's where it comes from. The fact that Jesus did it. The fact that he did have love, joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control when we don't. And then this crazy thing happens where the Holy Spirit brings all of that and puts it in us, right? He produces that fruit that we talk about. And so when we say we're not ashamed of the gospel, we orient our language and our activity and everything we do in the worship service and everything we do outside the worship service according to this. The law shows us our need for Jesus. And Jesus is the one who gives us the power to share his gifts with everyone. You track him with me. You see, this is how it works. So take a look at Isaiah 55, 11. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. I apologize for my emotion, but I didn't know Dara was going to be here today. And I was going to tell a story about him. So now that he's here, it's hard to tell the story. Um, so 
I was a vicar, and a vicar just means somebody who really, really is clueless. Pastor means someone who's currently learning how not to be clueless. But when you're a vicar, you're totally clueless. And I remember asking him one day, I'm like, but I kind of felt like nobody was listening to me that day, or whatever day I had preached, and we were talking about it. And, and uh, I had a lot to learn about all of that. And Dar was always so cool because he never, he never ever, like he, Dar's not the teacher who would say, you know, in order to do this, this is what you got to do. He instead would just, he would just demonstrate it to me, right? And so I was asking about this. I was frustrated. I felt like no one was listening. And so the next Sunday that he just gets up and he just demonstrates it. And, he's, and, and, the, and the language that if we used in a later conversation is you just unleash the word of God. You can't do anything. He is the power, right? And you unleash the Word of God. And that's what he taught me, not by just saying, Mark, you unleash the Word of God. That's how I learned things. But he demonstrated that. And so what happens is, is we trust his promise where he says, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. These are the words of God. You and I, we face all these situations. We face this tragedy, and people are saying things like, God needed more angels. Hear me when I say this. John, 1 John chapter 1, in God there is no darkness. God is not the author of evil. Please do not ever believe that lie. However, as we were talking in Bible class, sometimes we don't understand all the aspects of a situation. And so, yes, was God there? Very much so. But what was he probably doing? Was he there inflicting pain on those children so that they would go to heaven? Absolutely not. I can verifiably tell you that is not what has happened. Instead, I can tell you that he was present with them and holding them in his nail-scarred hands. And that's how God works. And this is what God's word does. He, it, it goes out, you unleash God's word, and he does stuff. And he participates in every single person's life. We talked about this last week. When we come to worship and we sort of get in that, I don't know what else to call it, that sort of God mode, I don't know what else to call it, um, you know, where you're sort of in and you're thinking about God's word and you're feeling it and you're, and you're singing about it and you're praying and then we go out into the world and then we're not in God mode a lot of times, right? We need to do that more. We need to spend more time in God's Word. Now, you might be sitting there going, sitting there going Mark, I don't, I don't know. I'm not a reading kind of guy. I'm not going to sit down with this 2,000-page book and go, hmm, yeah, that's very, that's very, and it's not who you are, right? Some of you guys are like, yeah, I, I just, when I, when I hear the Bible, it just confuses me, and I don't understand it. And I'm just going to say, <clears throat> here's, here's the story. So I told you, Debbie and I got married, and uh, after we talked about you know, getting married in the drive-thru. We didn't do that but um, after we got married, not too long later, we were, we were talking about we need to go to the grocery store, right? And I, and I said something to the effect of, so when you get back, this is what we need to do. She goes, no, no, we need to go to the grocery store. And I said, but I don't really know anything about the grocery store. Now, I was like 19, 20, no, I was 20 years old. And so uh, she goes, well, why don't you know anything about the grocery store? And I said, well, because I don't ever go there. What's, what's at the grocery store? Food, right? Kind of important if you're not a farmer and you don't live off the land, and I certainly am not. Do you see what the source, do you see what the grocery store is? It's the source of my sustenance, and I don't go there. I hope the irony is dripping somewhere and splashing on our heads, right? The source of our sustenance. We need to go there. And yes, it was painful, and she took, and she trained me, and I still didn't learn very much, but she... She's, she's very consistent in, in her guidance. And so I want to be consistent in my guidance to you. This is the source of our sustenance. It is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. And it changes things and it gives us the ability to navigate when terrible things happen and to put our trust in him because guess what? There was this one Friday that was the worst Friday in the history of the world and we somehow call it good because it was the day that Jesus died on the cross for you and for me to take all the evil and all the darkness upon himself that was reserved for you and me and we deserved. And he took it upon himself so that he could come down into the depths of the drowning waters of this whole world and save you and me. Everyone. Because his goal is not just to give us a good 80 years on this world, but life eternal. Can we pray about that? Please pray with me. Father, I pray right now that you would give us the gift of faith and trust and hope in and through all of these things.
Help us always know that you are the source of good and that we don't always understand what that is from our perspective. That you are the source of hope. That you are the source of all of the things that we need and your word is the place where we get them, whether it be spoken or written or even in everyday mysteries like the Lord's Supper. Help us trust in you for all of these things. Not because of anything we have to offer, but because of everything that Jesus did. He is your Son. He is our Lord. And He lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.